Gen Z might be the most difficult generation in the workplace. Top EU diplomat calls for European Navy patrols in the Taiwan Strait. Chile plans to enact state controls on lithium. Thai authorities issue extreme heat warnings for dozens of provinces. China envoy questions Ukraine sovereignty. Japan gets ready to shoot down N Korea spy satellite debris. Russia advising citizens to avoid traveling to Canada. Japan's crying baby sumo contest returns. Hello, I'm Johnny. Thank you for joining us on Funding News. It's Monday, April 24th, and here are your top stories. Resume builders survey 1,344 people in managerial positions across different industries in the U.S. earlier this month. Asking them about their experiences working with those born in 1997 or later. A staggering 79% said they find them the most difficult generation to have in the workplace. Managers and owners commonly cited entitlement and a lack of effort, motivation and productivity as reasons why they were given the boot. Despite this, some bosses said Generation Z employees were highly innovative and adaptable. But we're starting to hear another story. Gen Z are reportedly feeling intense fatigue and spiritual exhaustion, even as they just begin to take on careers and adult responsibilities. According to the survey, Gen Z workers are currently aged 26 and under, meaning that much of their working life has occurred amid the COVID pandemic. The marketing director at Hairbro, Adam Garfield, said that while Gen Z workers are often proficient in using digital communication tools, they may lack some of the interpersonal skills required for face-to-face -face interactions. He finds that youngsters also bring positive attributes to the workplace. He found they value authenticity and transparency. The EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell wrote in an opinion piece in the journal Du De Manche that Taiwan concerns us economically, commercially and technologically. That's why I call on European navies to patrol the Taiwan Strait to show Europe's commitment to freedom of navigation in this absolutely crucial area. Last Tuesday, in a speech opening a debate on China at the European Parliament, Borrell said Taiwan is clearly part of our geostrategic parameter to guarantee peace. After days of Chinese military exercise around the territory, European navies are being asked to intervene to guarantee peace in the Taiwan Strait. The top EU foreign chief said, it is not only for a moral reason that an action against Taiwan must necessarily be rejected. It is also because it would be, in economic terms, extremely serious for us, because Taiwan has a strategic role in the production of the most advanced semiconductors. Meanwhile, Guatemala's president, Alejandro Jamate, left on Saturday for a visit to Taiwan as the island looks to shore up its diplomatic links with Latin American countries. Last Thursday, Chilean President Gabriel Boric said he would nationalize the country's lithium industry and create a state-owned company to produce the metal that is a key component of electric vehicle batteries. Boric said future lithium contracts would only be issued as public-private partnerships with state control. Chile holds the world's largest lithium reserves and is the world's second-largest producer. The South American country is the world's second biggest producer of lithium that is key to making EV batteries. Lithium is currently produced from hard rock or brine mines. Australia is the world's biggest supplier, with production from hard rock mines. Argentina, Chile and China mainly produce it from salt lakes. According to the Resources and Energy Quarterly Report by the Australian Department of Industry, science and resources in March world output was 737,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent in 2022 and is estimated to reach 964,000 tons in 2023 and 1,167,000 tons in 2024. On Saturday, Thai authorities warned residents across the country, including the capital Bangkok, to avoid going outdoors due to extreme heat. According to the Thai Meteorological Department, the heat index, which includes relative humidity and measures what the temperature feels like, hit a record 54 degrees Celsius while in the Bakna district of Bangkok. The temperature reached 42 degrees Celsius. Authorities warned residents to avoid outdoor activities and be wary of the danger of heat stroke. Authorities in Thailand are calling on residents in Bangkok to stay indoors as extreme heat warnings are issued throughout Southeast Asia. Parts of Asia are reporting extreme heat this month, with record-breaking temperatures seen in some countries. In Bangladesh and parts of India, extreme heat is leading to a surge in power demand, causing power cuts and shortages for millions of people. Thailand's Department of Disaster Prevention and Mitigation said that temperatures will exceed 40 C in at least 28 provinces last Saturday. The country consumed more than 39,000 megawatts on April 6, surpassing the previous record of 32,000 megawatts in April last year. Time.
time on my own, I never thought I could be there. I take your blessings with your heartaches too. Chinese ambassador to Paris Lu Xiaoye said in an interview aired on French television last Friday that historically Crimea was part of Russia and had been offered to Ukraine by former Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. He added that these ex-USSR countries don't have actual status in international law because there is no international agreement to materialize their sovereign status. France responded on Sunday by stating that China will have to clarify whether these comments reflect its position or not. A senior Ukrainian presidential aide, Mikhailo Podolyak, wrote on Twitter, It is strange to hear an absurd version of the history of Crimea from a representative of a country that is scrupulous about its thousand-year history. On Sunday, a French foreign ministry spokesperson said that France has its full solidarity with all the allied countries affected. In terms of Ukraine specifically, the spokesperson said that the entire international community, including China, recognized Crimea as part of Ukraine in 1991. Last Saturday, Japan's defense chief ordered troops to activate missile interceptors and get ready to shoot down fragments from a North Korean satellite that may fall on Japanese territory. Japan's defense minister Yasukazu Hamada last Saturday instructed troops to ready Pac-3 surface-to-air missiles in southwestern Japan, including Okinawa and nearby islands, in an area believed to be under a flight path of a North Korean rocket that will carry the satellite. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un said earlier last week that its first military spy satellite will be launched at an unspecified date. In addition to the surface-to-air missiles, Defense Minister Yasukazu Hamada said he also ordered the deployment of destroyers equipped with SM-3 ship-to-air missiles to coastal waters. Japan's defense ministry said, We are making the necessary preparations because there is a possibility of issuing an order to destroy ballistic missiles and other objects. The Russian foreign ministry said last Saturday, with numerous cases of discrimination against Russians, including physical violence, it is advising citizens to avoid traveling to Canada. The Russian foreign ministry said, We recommend you refrain from traveling to this country for the purposes of tourism, education, and in the context of business relations. If you are already in Canada, we urge you to be vigilant, especially in public places. The advisory was posted on its Telegram channel last Saturday. Сразу отсекаем этот вопрос, потому что я на переезд потратил очень огромные деньги. Russia last week imposed sanctions on 333 Canadian officials and public figures, including prominent Olympians, in what it said was a tit-for-tat response to Canadian restrictions on Moscow and support for Ukraine. Shortly after the war started last year, Canada advised citizens to avoid all travel to Russia. Canada has been one of the most vocal backers of Ukraine during the recent war and has imposed sanctions on hundreds of Russian officials and companies as well as wide-scale trade bans. A crying baby sumo competition returns to Japan for the first time in four years, following COVID-19 cancellations in previous years. In the event held at Tokyo's Senzoji Temple, the babies are encouraged to cry in the sumo ring, and the infant who cries louder than the other is declared the winner of the bout. Traditionally, the babies have been held aloft by genuine sumo wrestlers, but due to concerns over COVID-19, this year they were carried by their parents. The event is intended to promote the baby's health, in the belief that a baby which cries loudly will grow up healthily. According to the organizer, a total of 64 babies participated in the ritual. Chairman of Asakusa Tourism Federation which organized the event, Shijimi Fuji, said this kind of event takes place in many places in Japan. But rules vary from region to region, in some places parents want their offspring to be the first to cry, in others the first to weep is the loser. Let's take a look at the vocabulary today from the news of the Generation Z. Number 1. Staggering. In the recent years, internet has been developing at a staggering speed. Number two, cite. Tiji Yuanying Ji Chu Shili Lie Ju. He cited his heavy workload as the reason for his breakdown. Number three, give somebody the boot. Jie Gu Mo Ren. The employee was given the boot for being tardy too often. Number four, adaptable. Yu Xing Nen Li De. Yu Xing Li De. Successful businesses are highly adaptable to economic change. 
And that's all for today's Funday News. Make sure you tune into Funday News from Monday to Friday and click the link below to join Funday for free. I'm Johnny Wu, your host. I will see you next time.